Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Everybody doing well? It is so good to see you. I know I said that last week, but it's finally good to have you in the building today. And and for all of you that are gathered here, I tell you, it's just been it's been awesome just to look around and see uh, familiar faces. Part of uh, our faith family is gathered here. Still, a lot of people who are not gathering with us just yet for different reasons. Uh, a lot of it has to do with probably our children's ministry, but we are glad that you're here this morning. And I just want to say to those that are still connecting with us online, we're glad that you're here as well and that you're connecting with us. We are making live stream a priority during this time, and, and it's so important that you are able to connect with us as a church, and so it's really good. Hey, I, I want to do something kind of old-fashioned this morning. I don't, I don't, I don't uh, usually do this, but I just want you, if you're in the room here today, obviously we can't do it at home, but if if you're in the room today, I want you to just look around to, to your left and to your right and just say, I'm glad you showed up today. Look at that. You know, I, I tell you, it's just really remarkable to be able to just do that. You know, uh, for so many weeks, I was here with just a few people, and we were gathered in this room, and I was looking at a camera, and we were, we were preaching the Word, but I mean, it is really good. And I'm, I just want to say, I am glad you showed up here this morning, okay? So, glad you're here with us here this morning. If you're a guest with us, we also want to say we're glad you're here as well. Uh, I tell you, uh, it's always awesome to have guests with us here today, and and um, and if you're if you're a guest here today, we want to connect with you, and we best do that by by connecting with you at our welcome desk, which is out in our front lobby. We have a gift that we want to give you if you're here today for the first time. And if you want to just go by that welcome desk and and fill out a connection card for us, we'd love to just connect with you and get to know you in in that way. And we also want to say that uh, if, if you're here today, we want you to know that we are a church that believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? We are a church that believes in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what does that mean? It means that we believe that, that Christ is sufficient in all things. That's what this, uh, this letter of Colossians that we're about to start on is really speaking into. But I think it's important that we understand that, that we believe here at Cross Point Church that Christ is sufficient in all things, starting with our, our salvation, believing also that, that God is in the business of reconciling people unto himself. That is, it is important for us to understand and to teach and to, to preach and also just say that, that God is sufficient, Jesus is sufficient in transforming lives and hearts and bringing even people together and having the church go out and carry out his mission. And so all of these things Jesus is sufficient in, and we as a church, we truly believe that the the gospel of Jesus Christ is the truth by which we live our life. And so, again, we're glad you're here. We're glad that we have this opportunity to study God's Word. I want to pray for us, and then we're going to dive right into Colossians. I know last week, we, 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 it took us a while to get there, but we're going to get there a little bit earlier today, and uh, I'm just excited about this message here this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day, and God, we thank you for your presence in this place. God, we know that where we are gathered together, 
uh, God, your presence is there as well. And so, Father, we thank you, God, for what you're going to do in this place. We thank you for what you've already done in our hearts. And God, the, just the life transformation that has taken place and just simply knowing and believing and trusting in Jesus Christ. And Father, today we are gathered in this room to worship you. We've done that in a spirit of just lifting up our voices in song and praise and adoration and worship. God, we do that through our prayers. But God, we also do that through the reading and the preaching of your word. And Lord, it's at this time that we, we pray, God, that you would just prepare our hearts and our minds for what it is that you want to speak into our life. God, we know you have a word for us today. And because of that, Lord, we look forward with great anticipation to the reading of your word, the reading of your scripture. And God, we just, we, we just want to hear from you this morning. And so, Father, prepare our hearts that we would be ready to receive that which you want to give us this morning. We love you. We praise you. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. So last week, we kicked off a series called The Preeminence of Christ. And I won't go into that a lot this morning because the reality is we're going to actually be talking in depth about that next week as we dive deeper into the Christology that, that this letter uh, offers to us, uh, this, this letter that Paul wrote to the Colossians. And so it, it's, it's really amazing. It's been said that Colossians offers one of the most profound teachings of Christology in the New Testament. And so if you want to learn about Jesus, if you want to understand about his preeminence, if you want to learn about his sufficiency, if you want to learn that he is the head of all things, then go to Colossians. And at least in the first chapter of this amazing book, you're going to find that, that what Paul does is he takes a very theological tour of who Christ Jesus really is. And it's really powerful when you begin to read what the Word of God mentions here, but why is it that Paul decided in this letter to offer such a profound teaching on Jesus? Well, I mentioned a little bit last week, but the, the reality is the church at Colossae was, was in danger. It was a young church, it wasn't a very old church, and they had received the truth of the gospel. In other words, they had come to faith in Christ Jesus. They understood who Jesus was. They understood that, 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 that God had transformed their life through Christ. But as with any church, uh, there were those within it that began to spread a false gospel. And they began to teach things that were outside of authentic Christianity. They began to teach things by adding things to the Word of God or to the gospel. And so as a result of this, people were confused. People were wondering about what was going on and what was truth. And, and even as they began to have conversations themselves, they were speaking a false gospel. Unintentionally, they were promoting things that were outside of the faith of authentic Christianity. And so the Apostle Paul, he writes to the Colossians this letter to, to offer to them clarity. He wants to present to them the truth of who Christ is. In other words, he wants to counter false teaching with correct orthodox teaching. And so here we see this letter where, where Paul is, is starting to, to teach these things, and we're just getting into this letter. Uh, this morning, I want to invite you, if I haven't already, to turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 9 through 14, and we're going to be diving into this passage, which teaches us so much about what we need to know as we prepare for a study like this. In our passage today, we're going to see where he and Timothy, Timothy's got a part in writing this letter, we know, because he mentions Timothy at the very beginning of this letter. But the two of them are writing to the Colossians, and as they're writing this letter, they sort of do the introduction, that which we looked at last week, and then they move into speaking about a very important issue in the life of the church, in the life of any believer, really. And that is prayer and praise. And so here's what Paul's going to do. He's going to sort of set things up with this, this truth, this, this understanding that we need to have on, 
on prayer and worship. And he's going to present this as really the, the prelude to Christology, to understanding who Jesus is. And so he's going to present this because this is, this is really important for the life of the church to understand. And so read with me, if you will, starting with verse 9 and following through to verse 14. Here's what the Word of God has to say to us this morning. Paul writes, he says, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. He says, may you be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transformed us or transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption for the forgiveness of sin. How many of you are thankful that we have redemption through his son, the forgiveness of our sin? Amen. That is something worth celebrating right there. We could just camp out right on that one verse, and we're going to get to it here as we walk through this, series, this, uh, this, this passage this morning. But, but there's a lot that we need to talk about, and so I need to just go ahead and dive in from the beginning. There's basically two parts that I want to divide this passage up into. The first few verses, what we're going to see is that Paul talks a lot about prayer. And he mentions the benefits of prayer. He talks about what he's specifically praying for as he prays with Timothy uh, for the Colossian church. He's praying for them and he wants them to know what are these things that I'm praying for you about. So we see that in the first couple of verses. And then at the last part of this passage that we're going to see, we're going to see that what Paul does then is he moves it into a place of, of offering thanks given to God, praises to God. In other words, he moves into a time of worshiping Jesus because of who Jesus is. And so we see this sort of this, this sort of understanding of these two parts. And here's a little bit of Bible trivia for you here this morning. If you were to be reading through the Greek uh, language, the original text was written. If you were to go from verse 9 all the, way, all the way to verse 20, that would be one sentence in the Greek language. Which means that Paul didn't take a breath when he was writing this. I mean, he just, he just ran with it. I don't know that that would be correct in the English language, but it's okay in the Greek. But here Paul is going to break this text up into two pieces. And so I want to do that here this morning as we look at this. Now, let's start with the first one, which is prayer. Prayer is such an important part of who we are as believers. And I want you to think about that for just a moment. I want you to hear what I'm saying. Prayer is such a vital part of who we are as believers, as followers of Christ Jesus, as disciples, it should be on the forefront of everything we do. In fact, in Thessalonians, we see where we are as believers to pray without ceasing. And in fact, when we look at this letter, we see that Paul mentions that as he talks about this time of prayer that he and Timothy are involved in. As he writes this letter, he says this. He says, we have not ceased to pray for you. Now, I, I think it's interesting uh, when, you, when you think about this whole mindset of not ceasing to, to pray for uh, a specific person, you, you begin to wonder, you know, well, how does he pray for everybody else, right? If he's so busy, consume with prayer. But it's a mindset that Paul is really revealing to them and what we also see in, the, in, in Thessalonians where, where, where the reality is Paul's heart as someone who's been transformed by the gospel through the blood of Christ, who is no longer who he used to be, but a new creation in Jesus. His identity is not in of himself, but is now in Christ Jesus. 
He is someone who is constantly thinking about the things of God, and because of that, he finds himself in constant prayer and adoration and praise before a holy and righteous God. He's praying constantly. And so he says here, he says, we are praying for you. And as we look at Paul's prayer, we begin to see this amazing model of how we too can pray for each other. And I think that's important. I would say this to you this morning and to those who are gathered at home, I covet your prayers. As a pastor and and even as our staff here, we appreciate your prayers. We desire for you to be praying for us because there's a task that we have to lead this faith family and to follow Jesus and to know his will and to understand his mission and to not only that, but try to handle all the disappointments that life throws our way. And so we covet your prayers. I covet your prayers. But in the same token, you should know that we as a staff are also lifting up your prayers day by day. In other words, we're praying for you. This morning as our worship team was gathered up here and they were practicing, they were getting ready. And wasn't worship amazing this morning? Amen. And so, amen. And so, there was four or five of you that liked it anyway. So, uh, but, uh, but the reality is, is that as, as they were practicing, I was just walking through these aisles and I was praying. I didn't touch your seat, I promise you, but, but I was walking through these aisles praying for you. I didn't know who was going to be sitting where, but I was praying for you because here's what I want you to know. God wants to do something remarkable in your life. And your pastor wants God to do something remarkable in your life. And so therefore, I'm praying for you, just like Paul was praying for the Colossians. And so what is Paul praying for? As Paul says, we're, 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 we're not ceasing to pray for you. We are going to be in continual prayer for you. As he does this, what exactly is it that Paul is praying for? Well, first of all, we see that Paul petitions God that the Colossians would be filled, look at this, with knowledge and understanding. This is important for us to understand. In verse 9, it says this. It says, we have not ceased to pray for you. Look at what he says. Asking, asking who? Asking God that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And this is hugely important because of the reality that that for, for Paul, he understands what the Colossians are up against. He understands that they are, they are, as believers and followers of Christ, they're trying to understand this thing called Christianity. They're trying to see and understand how it is that, that Christ relates to who they are and what Christ has done in their life. They're, they're on this new journey, just like maybe some of you here in this room here this morning. They're on a new journey of exploring and, and learning about Jesus. And you have all these issues being thrown at them, which is contrary to the gospel. And so Paul knows what they're up against. He knows the challenges that they face. And so he prays that they would be filled with knowledge of God's will, with the understanding of who God is. Can you imagine, if you will, for just a moment, a church that is made up of mostly new believers who are excited about their faith, just like we are, excited about their faith, trying to learn as much as they can, but they have these two influences that are leading them astray from the truth of God's word. Here's what the two, here's two, tru, uh, two false teachings or two sources, I should say, of the false teachings they were receiving. One is Greek philosophy. You see, the reality was that the Greeks were well known for their philosophy, their, their ideas, their, their thoughts. And so they were real good at presenting this to the world. And so as a result, as these new believers were coming up against Greek philosophy, they were hearing some really good ideas. But you got to remember, these are just man's ideas. Whether they're good or bad, it doesn't really matter. It's not the word of God. And so here we have this Greek philosophy that was starting to merge with the word of God. And in some cases, it was just wrong. 
And so the Apostle Paul says, beware of those kinds of things. The Word of God is the truth of true Christianity, and we don't have a reason to go outside of that. The other thing that was sort of coming up against them was Jewish legalism. There were certain ceremonies that they were trying to bring into their new faith in Christ Jesus that just didn't have to be. And so as a reality, he was speaking about those. And we're going to see as we read through this letter that he's going to address those types of things. The message that Paul is getting ready to preach is the preeminence of Christ Jesus. That he came before everything else, and he always will be, and we, are, we have all we need in Christ. In other words, he is sufficient for your life. You don't have to add anything else to Jesus. Jesus is awesome just like he is, and we worship an awesome God. Amen? Amen. Amen. He is just as good as he always will be, just as he is. Is. And so this is the message that Paul has for the church. So Paul is praying that they would be filled with this truth about God. You know, in, in First Corinthians, I mean First Chronicles chapter 29, there's a passage of scripture known as King David's Prayer. I read a portion of that prayer last week. I want to sort of revisit that this week because I think this is very powerful. So King David offers up this prayer to God. But before that, he assembles the officials and the leaders of Israel. He brings them together, and he begins to share with them some things current concerning the future. In other words, he says, you know, I'm not going to be around forever, and so here's what you need to know. And so he kind of gives them that. And then he addresses his son Solomon, and he, he talks about Solomon, and, and, and he, he, he addresses Solomon. He charges Solomon with, with basically two things, love God and serve him. And so he is a challenge to his son Solomon. And then he comes to this place where they all begin to worship. And then as they, as they sort of wrap that up with these offerings that they are making to the Lord, he moves into a time of prayer. And this is what I want to read for you this morning because I think this is powerful. Verse 11 I read last week, but I want to read 11 and 12 this week. Look at this. This is what David prays. He says, Yours, O oh Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O oh Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Verse 12, both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Is there any doubt that David, what David thought about God? There's no doubt, is there? In his prayer, he begins this prayer with these mighty words, and we read this, and we, we are encouraged. If you've ever wondered what David thought of God, just read these two verses. He says here, he says here, Lord, you are great. You are power. You are glory, victory, majesty. He is just laying out the attributes of who God is. He said, God, there is no one greater than you. In fact, he says, all that is in heaven and on earth, that belongs to you. You have been exalted as head above all things. You rule over everything. Your hand is power and might, and you give strength to all. That's a God worth following, isn't it? That's our God. That's our God. And He accomplished all of that through His Son, Jesus Christ. All of that. You don't have to add anything to Jesus. Because Jesus is sufficient. Jesus is enough. You don't have to add anything to the Gospel. He doesn't need our help. He is sufficient in all things. So let me ask you, this morning as we prepare to just continue to walk through this, what is your knowledge of God? We just read what David's knowledge of God is. We know what he thinks of God. What do you think of God? 
How do you see God? Who do you know God to be? The reality, that's an important question. Because you see, if you start at the same place that David starts, knowing who God is, then your prayer is going to be much different than if you really don't know who God is. You see, we have a real problem in our world today. We sort of see God as Santa Claus. And what I mean by that is we say, man, I need this in my life, or I, more dangerously, I want this in my life. And who do we run to? We run to Santa Claus, right? Because he's the bearer of all gifts, right? So we run to him and say, God, here's what I'm praying for this morning. I would love a red, shiny Ferrari. Okay, I'll settle for a BMW. Maybe your prayers aren't that specific. But the reality is when we have a view of who God is, that everything belongs to him, that he is majestic, that he is wonderful, that he is mighty, that he offers strength to all, then suddenly God begins to take on a greatness that maybe we didn't imagine before we went to him in prayer. And as we contemplate who God is, suddenly our, our, our prayer life is, God, change my heart. God, change our community. God, change our world. Because he is capable. He is capable. It's amazing how little when we find ourselves in need or in pain or in hurt or in worry or in discouragement, we as believers and followers of Christ Jesus feel as though we can't trust him with our problems. When we begin to view God like King David viewed God, guess what? It changes everything. As we read through the scriptures, we begin to realize just how powerful he is. So Paul, he prays here for knowledge. He also prays that the Colossians would walk worthy of the Lord. So here's what he does. He prays and he says, man, I pray that you would have a greater understanding of who Jesus is. I pray that you would understand. But as you take on this greater understanding of Jesus, as you begin to wrap your minds around who Jesus is, I pray that you would now walk. In other words, the result of your understanding of God would be to walk in a manner that is worthy of the gospel by which you have been saved. What does that mean? Paul's saying, man, if, you're, if, if God has transformed your life, then, then he's doing more than that. Look at verse 10 and 11 with me. He says, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge, being strengthened with all power. Let me just stop right there. I, I had not got time to even preach all of that, really. But the reality is here, Paul is saying, a profound knowledge of God will affect profoundly our walk with Christ. A profound knowledge of God will affect profoundly our walk with Christ. When we begin to see God like King David saw God, we begin to walk out our faith a little differently, don't we? We begin to live our life in a pursuit of the holiness of God. We begin to live our life in a pursuit of the things of Christ rather than all the things of the world which we think are going to satisfy our desires, but really we just long for more of that. We are never satisfied of that. But if we go to Jesus, the living water, our thirst is quenched. And suddenly we are living out our life as believers and followers of Christ Jesus. You see, the fact of the matter is, ultimately the evidence of knowing God, the way we should know God, is living in a manner that's pleasing to Him. To where God looks down upon our life and He is pleased. Living a life that is in pursuit of really the righteousness of God. That which He has bestowed on us already as believers through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so here we begin to see what that Paul describes what walking worthy looks like. He, he mentions several things. The first thing he mentions here is your walk should be fully pleasing to Him. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. 
I, I don't know about you, but that's a great verse to wake up to in the morning, right? Before your feet ever get out of bed, before you ever roll out of bed and go anywhere, uh, it would be just a, a great thing to pray this prayer. 1 Corinthians 10 31, wouldn't it? Whether I eat or drink or God, whatever I do today, my prayer is I would do it all for the glory of God, that I would live for Jesus. God, that every conversation I have, every action I take, every moment of my day, I would live for your glory. And so here he says, be fully pleasing to him. Secondly, he says, your walk should be bearing fruit. What does it mean to bear fruit? I think there's a lot of different things that it could mean to bear fruit. I think going out and fulfilling the, the Great Commission by sharing Jesus with others, we can see others come to know Christ. That can be a fruit. But here I think it really points to something a little bit differently. I remember right after I went into ministry, I was at my first church and serving there as a student pastor some 100 years ago, just seems like forever ago. And I remember there came a time when they were going to ordain me into the, into the ministry. And so I stood before a, a group of very godly men and they began to question me with theological and doctrinal questions to, to really do a bit of vetting to make sure that that I was ready to be ordained into the gospel. And, and man, I'm telling you, they were slinging some doozies. They were just tossing these questions out. <clears throat> and it was, a, it was a little bit unnerving to just sit there and be, have this sort of oral exam taking place in your life on theological issues and doctrinal issues and even some practical issues. And finally, it came that time where the, where the pastor sort of looked at me and says, well, I guess, I guess we're all ready here. I mean, it looks great. You've, you've answered all these questions. Let me pray uh, for a moment. We'll have you step out. We'll talk behind your back for a little bit, and then we'll bring you back in and let you know what our decision is. And I was honestly very relieved. I was glad that the, the torture was over, right? I was glad the waterboarding was, was done, right? And so here I was, and I was, I was ready to step out. And then all of a sudden, this, this elderly man, this elderly gentleman who was sitting in the back, a very godly guy, he said, well, I have a question. And I thought, man, we're starting all over. I wanted to say, you've had your chance, but I had to be respectful. And I'll never forget what he said. He said, David, what is the fruit of a Christian? What is the fruit of a Christian? Immediately, my mind went to the Great Commission to produce more, to make disciples. And so I started sharing that, but I could see by the look of his face, he was, he was wanting a little something else. He was like, well, yeah, of course, you've already said that. I, I want a little something a little bit deeper. And, and all I could really think about was the fruit of the Spirit, which is exactly what he was looking for. You see here, when Paul says these things, when he says, I, I pray that, that you would have an understanding of who God is, that, that you, would, you would understand with knowledge and wisdom exactly who God is and that you would allow God to transform your life and that this would happen so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the gospel and that you would, you, you would have all of these things that are taking place. You would be pleasing to Him, but you would bear fruit Here's what Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. You know these. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. How well are you doing at these things? Here's, here's the reality, and I want to say this, because I think so often we try to do all of these things in our own strength and our own power. These are fruits of the Spirit. Paul is praying for the Colossians because he desires that they would grow in a deep understanding, and he realizes that the reason he is praying is because they can't change themselves. This is the fruit of the Spirit. And so he goes to the, 
to the one whom he knows can change their life and he prays that they would bear fruit. Jesus said it like this. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit and that your fruit should remain so that wherever, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. And so there he says, go to the Father and ask. And so as we think about producing fruit of the Spirit, then let us go to the Father and ask that it may be granted to us. And then finally, as he talks about living out our faith, he says, he says this, he says, your walk will be strengthened with all power. Here's what we know about who Christ is, is that he, his work is not finished in us. Amen? Here's the reality. You might have gotten saved yesterday or 150 years ago like I did, right? That's how I feel sometimes, 150 years old. I feel tired and worn. No, I'm kidding you. But the reality is that God is still not done with us. He is still producing fruit. He is still growing us and maturing us as believers and followers in Christ Jesus. Strengthened. Strengthening us with all power. Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so this is Paul's prayer for the church. Boy, I am out of time already and we don't even have time to get into the praise, but we're gonna, we're gonna dash through it if you'll just hang on with me. I'm, you know, what I love about how Paul wraps this text up What's really amazing about how he sort of wraps this, brings it all to a head, is he wraps it up with thanksgiving and praise. Another word for that is just worship. He's thankful to God. He's, he praises God through thanksgiving. And so he says here in verse 12, this is that second part that, that I had wanted to get to and spend some time in, but, but he says here in verse 12 and following, he says, giving thanks to the Father who is qualified to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You see, the Bible repeatedly stresses the importance of praising God by thanksgiving. Thanksgiving should permeate through our conversations, our songs, our, our actions, and everything that we are, and specifically in our prayers. And so Paul, as he prays, he offers thanksgiving to God. Here's what Paul is saying. He says, it is Jesus who has delivered you from the domain of darkness. How many of you are thankful for that? Amen? It is Jesus who has delivered you from the domain of darkness. It is Jesus who has brought us into the kingdom of God. We are no longer to, you know, uh, for, to be used as folly to the enemy. We are instead brought in as uh, sons and daughters of Jesus Christ himself, of, of, of our Lord and our Savior. We are brought into the kingdom of God. It is Jesus who redeemed us from our sins. It is Jesus who delivered us uh, from our sins through the forgiveness of our sins. And it is Jesus who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints. Galatians 4, 7, and I'm almost done. He says this, he says, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then God has made you an heir. Powerful, powerful thing that we see going on here. I'm going to ask the band to come on out if they will as we wrap things up here this morning. But let me just say this in closing. So Paul, as he's thinking about what the Colossians are facing, he first prays, and then he prays, praises. He prays, he petitions God, and he praises the Lord. And you know, as I was reading through this, this morning, or not this morning, but this week, as I was preparing for this message here, I was thinking it would be appropriate for us to do the same. 
You know, as believers and followers of Christ Jesus, it'd be very appropriate, I think, for us to be praying for each other. Amen? Amen. To be praying for each other. What do we pray for? How do I pray for you? How do you pray for me? I think it would be appropriate if we prayed this prayer that is found in 1 Colossians 9 through 14, just in case you want to reference it in your prayers. Go back and pray this for each other. I'm going to pray for you this week that you would grow in wisdom and understanding of who God is. And that as God grants you that that wisdom, as He pours into you and He begins to fill you with His knowledge and understanding of who He is, that it would impact your life. I want you to pray for me in the same way. Pray that we would be filled with knowledge and understanding so that that which is on our lips is praise and worship. Amen? Amen. Could we do that this week? Why don't we do this? I don't want to overwhelm you with having you pray for the whole church. Why don't you just pick one person a day? Just pick one person. One person that's on your mind, whoever God lays on your mind, every day of this week, just choose a different one. You can pray for the whole church. But be more specific. Just think about that person, that individual that God has brought into your life. Think about that person. Maybe your significant other. Maybe someone you're doing life with. Maybe a friend or a co-worker. And just lift that person up in prayer. And pray that God would give them understanding of uh, uh, of who He is. You know, yesterday I was in one of my favorite places in the whole world, Home Depot. I love going in there. Linnell says, what are you going for? I said, I don't know. I'm going to walk every aisle because I know there's something I need, right? I went by there yesterday and as I was there, I was checking out, I was getting ready to check out and I heard heard these words. Hey, Pastor David. So I knew it was somebody who knew me, right? I turned around and there was a young man and he came to me and we began to just talk about life and where he had been for the last 12 weeks and what he was going through. And, and, and he was asking me about the church and hoping to be able to come back and, uh, real soon. And, and, and so we just had this great conversation. And then as we got ready, I got ready to leave, I checked out and I was walking out. And he kind of followed me outside. And he, we were still talking. And, and I could tell there was just something else on his mind. And, and, uh, and, and something was, you know, he was just wanting to say something before we departed. And, and finally, he just looked at me. He says, can I ask you to do something? Will you be praying for me? I thought, man, if you knew what I was preaching tomorrow. He said, would you be praying for me? And then he started just kind of sharing some stuff that was going on in his life. And I said, I'd be honored to pray for you. I began to share with him that I wanted to pray about how God would just fill him up with an understanding of who Jesus is and that he would come to the conclusion that Jesus was sufficient in his life. That Jesus was preeminent. I don't even know if he understood that word or had ever heard it before, but that that Jesus was preeminent in his life and that Jesus was sufficient and that Jesus was the head of all things. And, And so I prayed this for him. I prayed that God would just move in his life and And then what would be a result of all of that would be one of joy and contentment and peace and understanding. And that as he began to experience all of these things, that that would lead to praise and worship. 